Uh, hi, uh, my name is Suresh Vinakota, and today I'm going to be talking about um, non, the uh, Archimedean property, uh, non-Archimedean spaces, and uh, in particular, uh, ultrametric spaces. So uh, yeah, these are all uh, maybe terms we might be familiar with from real analysis classes, uh, like the Archimedean property may sound familiar, metric spaces may sound familiar, but um, we're going to add a little bit of abstraction onto that, you know, just for, just for some fun. So we're going to start with uh, some of the things we're familiar with, the Archimedean property, or we're going to talk about metric spaces, and we're going to sort of uh, relax and or strengthen some of the, the conditions that we, we put in when we define these, these objects. And then we're going to go through, go into some examples, uh, some consequences of, of what we're studying. So I kind of hope that this talk will uh, maybe lead into uh, another presentation, and I'll get into that. Uh, in, in a little bit. So with that in mind, let's talk about Archimedes of Syracuse. So uh, of course, a very legendary uh, ancient Greek mathematician, philosopher, physicist, etc. Um, made a lot of contributions like very early on. He approximated a lot of uh, like the area under a parabola, just like a lot of very fancy things. And uh, one of the things that he postulated was that uh, if you think about a number, right, um, you should be able to add any smaller number to itself, like as many times as you want to get past or beyond this, this number. Um, a lot of Archimedes, um, a lot of his, his pitch was uh, sort of tackling the idea of what infinity really means, with like his myriad of myriads uh, argument. So uh, the Archimedean property was born. Uh, it was kind of formalized later on that uh, given a a real number, there exists a natural number so that if you add one to itself uh, that many times, or if you just consider the natural number that is one added that many times, you can find uh, a natural number such that n uh, exceeds x. Uh, so this is actually very particular to the real and the natural numbers. So if we want to maybe generalize our idea to um, any metric space or any ordered field, uh, we're gonna want maybe a more general idea. And so with that, we're gonna talk about infinitesimal and infinite uh, elements. Uh, so sorry, there's a lot going on this, on this slide, but uh, to take it very slow, we're sort of just generalizing um, what we mean about the Archimedean principle or the Archimedean property over the real numbers. So, um, let's talk about let K be an ordered field, right? So we just want uh, an ordering. So like some sort of idea of what bigger than means, but we want it to work well with our field operations. So given a field, uh, an ordered field or one that behaves properly, uh, we're gonna pick two elements and say that X is infinitesimal with respect to Y, if and only if you cannot exceed Y, uh, no matter how many times you add X. So uh, this is kind of saying that like, no matter how many times we add it up, we can never get beyond Y. Y is somehow out of reach. So X is like really small with respect to Y, it's infinitesimal. The same way from X's perspective, Y sort of looks infinite, right? You can take as many steps in that direction as you can, you'll never get there. So we're gonna call Y infinite with respect to X. So we're gonna define, uh, we're going to say that an ordered field K has the Archimedean property, if and only if every X in K is not infinitesimal with respect to one. That means that you can add it uh, as a certain amount of times and get um, something that's beyond the unit one. Um, so this is, we can think about why this is equivalent later on. We're sort of just delving into what we mean by the Archimedean principle. And so with that, we're going to set a talk about an example of a an, of an, uh, non-Archimedean set. So if we can pose the, um, the motivating question here, where we know that the naturals, the rationals, and the reals uh, sort of abide by the Archimedean property. Um, they, they get exactly what we expect them to get. Uh, we, they behave really well. So it's kind of hard to imagine something uh, in which we, we don't have this property. So why don't we just go for broke and try to try to make one? Um, so to that end, we can define, uh, we can recall the definition of a metric space. Uh, we can kind of say it's, it's a pair uh, of a set M and uh, this is just a collection of objects and a distance function 
or a function on the Cartesian product into the, the positive real numbers that um, has three properties. We say that it has coincidence, which means that it's only zero when the points we're measuring the distance from are actually the same point, they're on top of each other. Uh, we say that they're symmetric, so it doesn't matter whether we start at x or start at y when we're measuring the distance. And finally, we want to say that it sort of measures the, the smallest possible distance between any two points. So if we add any third stopping point in the middle, uh, that path should be longer. So that's the triangle inequality. And now we're going to strengthen the triangle inequality to something called the ultra the, the ultrametric inequality. And we're going to call it an ultrametric space, of course. Um, so we're going to say that not only does it have to be smaller than the sum of the two distances, it actually has to be smaller than the maximum of the two distances. So if you think about the geometry here, if you actually pick any three points, you're going to get an isosceles triangle. Uh, so that's maybe something uh, you can think about uh, if you want to pause the video and think about it, uh, you, this is called an isosceles set because any three points you pick will have the property that they create an isosceles triangle. So I'll leave that as maybe like a little puzzle for uh, the audience to think about. And uh, yeah, so now let's try to explore uh, maybe an example of, of what's going on here with ultrametric spaces. Uh, so we're going to maybe talk about two, and <laughs> hopefully we'll, we'll find ourselves in a, in a sort of comfortable position. So again, once again, excuse all of the, the math on the screen. I'll try to go through it a little bit slowly. Um, so we're going to start with the rational numbers. Uh, this is a, a set that we're pretty confident and uh, comfortable with. And uh, for any rational number, you know, it's just a ratio of two integers. So we're going to pick those two integers to be n and m, right? And if you select a prime, we know that uh, the integers are UFD, they're unique factorization domains. There's a unique way in which we can pull out um, a prime number uh, P from each of these numbers. And we we're, we're gonna wanna pick out like the maximum possible E1. So this D1 should not be divisible by uh, P. So similarly, similarly, D2 cannot be divisible by P as well. Um, and so we're gonna pull out one one uh, prime number completely. And um, we, once we consider the ratio, we can sort of simplify it to just be, uh, we're gonna subtract the powers and we have this ratio of the two uh, like leftover integers. So if we fix a positive number in between zero and one, excuse me, we can define a norm. Um, there's a canonical way to lift a norm into a, uh, into a distance metric, which we'll look at in a second. But, um, we're gonna define the norm to just be replace the P with a C and raise it to the same exponent and sort of ignore this, this uh, non-divisible portion. So we're just gonna say that uh, uh, this is, you, you can observe that this only goes to zero when X is zero, right? And that sort of satisfies our, our intuition about norms uh, or the size of a vector. So uh, of course, this is the, the canonical lifting into a distance function. We can just take the difference and then take the norm of that, uh, the resulting difference. So of course, uh, the whole point of defining this is that we wanna say that uh, the rational numbers under this metric is actually an ultra metric space. Um, and so we can say that we do need to check uh, coincidence symmetry and the ultra metric inequality. We can, leave coincidence and symmetry as maybe an exercise and say that the ultrametric inequalities may be the more important, interesting part of this proof. So if we maybe simplify our notation a little bit here, uh, we're gonna call this coefficient just D1 uh, and we're gonna call this, this power E1 so that we have some nice notation over here, like D1 P to the E1. And we're gonna continue with uh, Y and Z as well. And this kind of gives us a little back of the envelope calculation that uh, if you calculate the distance between any two points, you can pull out a minimal, uh, yeah, you can only pull out the smallest, the smaller of the two uh, exponents, right? So E1 or E3. And of course, this minimum is less than or equal to the maximum of the minimums. So um, that gives us exactly uh, what we want with the, with the ultrametric inequality. So how can we relate this back to the course? We've kind of gone through a bunch of definitions. So what was really the point of doing all this? So where's the Galois theory? Uh, so the first thing we're gonna say is we're gonna, we wanna eliminate this, the, the power that C sort of holds in this, 
so C has kind of appeared as this parameter. Uh, we don't really know what it's doing. Uh, so let's just get rid of it and say that the topology generated, if we were to consider open balls or unions of open balls as our open sets, um, the topology generated by these two uh, metrics is actually uh, equivalent. So the way we're going to say that is if we were able to find a, a an epsilon ball in the second or, or a different C, if we were to pick another C and generate an epsilon ball that's equivalent to any epsilon ball with respect to the first C, um, then we can say that any open set in one is an open set of the other. We can generate a, um, a sort of back and forth relationship between the two. And uh, if you just stare at how we've defined things a little bit, this actually comes pretty quickly. Just another uh, uh, sort of equation for solving between uh, what the distances mean. Um, so yeah, you can get uh, E2 or epsilon 2 my bad, <laughs> as, a, as a function of epsilon 1. Um, and yeah, that, that sort of gives us the fact that the, the two topologies are indeed equivalent. And finally, that brings us to a friendly face, which is actually hopefully uh, the next presentation that you'll watch in the sequence, um, that we meet the p-adic numbers. If we're able to uh, uh, consider the norm completion of Q with respect to this, this norm, uh, this means that we're gonna consider Cauchy sequences and uh, bring in any element that we can converge to with elements of Q under this norm. Uh, this is actually the p adic numbers, which uh, hopefully will lead into another uh, more interesting conversation in uh, a different presentation. So with that, uh, I want to point to some, some resources that I found uh, this material on. Uh, these are all hyperlinked. Uh, you can email me at uh, my first name, not my last name, that's um, to, to get the, the links to these. Uh, this last one is a paper that I used to uh, learn a little bit more about the p adic numbers. Um, and of course, as always, uh, thank you, Prof. Goins, uh, for helping me out. And with that, uh, thank you very much.